All right. Good afternoon. Buenos tardes. I know it's too early for buenas noches, but soon. Welcome to the Rapporteur session uh, for 2017. I'm Stacy Stender, the current chair of CCSA at the end of this conference. It will be handed over to someone else. So I presented this slide at the opening. I just wanted to show you all the numbers of abstracts submitted over the years and the number and percentage accepted. You can kind of see, I don't actually have the percentage um, for each year, but this year about 50%. I'm only talking about the abstracts, not the symposia that were submitted. So this year, sadly, I cannot see that far. 1681, even with my new glasses, 1681 and 857 were accepted. So there we go, 1681, and there were 128 oral abstract presentations in 19 sessions, 187 of the short orals in 18 session, and then we had 57 poster sessions. So I'd like to introduce you to the amazing CCSA subgroup two, who are all sitting here, who are about to present the rapporteur. Uh, we have all of our sections. Yes, I think they definitely deserve a hand before. Those of you in the audience can only appreciate how much work it is to put together this session. So we have James Seddon from the Adult and Child Lung Health Section, Mercy from uh, Representing Civil Society, Karen Middlecoop from HIV, Omara from Tobacco Control, Wendy Wobester for TB, and then for our subsections we have Elaine Nyariha, did I do that? from Bacteriology and Immunology, Lynette from Nurses and Allied Professionals, and Alejandro, who is the program secretary, had to leave in Simeon Cadmus, the incoming program secretary, is here in his place. A big thank you to all of the chairs of the oral abstract-driven sessions who provided your feedback, as well as the posters, your feedback on what you thought were the best sessions in the, in the uh, best, excuse me, the best abstracts in the sessions that you chaired. There was a huge number of people. Uh, I just wanted to highlight, this is our second year we had a student session. Uh, this year it was sponsored by JATA. All of the students were brought, were funded to come through JATA and we wanna give a, a big round of applause for JATA, it was a great opportunity. <laughs> We had nine presenters from eight countries. It was a fabulous session. Unfortunately, there were not many attendees. It was in a small room, but I urge you all to look at their abstracts. They were all fabulous. Uh, one point I want to make, five of the nine presenters were women, and I think that we're moving forward in having new scientists uh, in the field of TB. And we had topics from air quality and, and TB to zoonotic TB. And with that, I will pass over to James as the Dalton Child Lung Health. We're gonna do A to Z in 50 minutes. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm gonna give you a whistle-stop tour of some of the highlights of the adult and child lung health section. The next study also in adults lung health is a poster which was presented um, from Addis Ababa um, to look at perceptions of asthma control. And in this study, um, patients with asthma, with diagnosed asthma, were, were questionnaired before their appointment with a physician and asked what their perce perceptions of their asthma control were. Then they saw the physician and a, a rigorous GINA symptom tool was used to evaluate their symptoms. And really what this found was that the perception of asthma control was quite different between the patients and um, the physicians. Although there was some concordance, the kappa value was only 0.18. What we see is that uh, there were quite a few patients who felt the control was good where the clinicians felt it was not so good. And this is a relatively straightforward study, but it really highlights is that although it's important to get asthma treatment and medication correct, it's equally important that partnerships are built between providers and their patients and that each understand each other. Moving on to some pediatric studies. Um, Four cities in India were, um, were included in this large study where upfront gene expert testing was used. 42,000 children were evaluated with gene expert. Samples were taken from a wide variety of um, samples, sites from the children. 
Samples were collected remotely and sent to a centralized laboratory where um, they were rapidly processed and results transmitted by um, text message and, um, and email, and results were available very quickly. What they found was that um, 3,300 children were diagnosed with confirmed disease, which is about 8%, and 9% had rifampicin resistance. These children wouldn't have been diagnosed had this study not been done. The next study looks at um, contacts, child contacts of drug-resistant patients in Armenia and documents um, what happens in the absence of any prevention therapy. Children at baseline under 15, <coughs> and in this study there were 150 children of 78 index cases, um, were recruited and divided into those with prevalent disease, uh, prevalent infection or um, uh, incident infection and disease. And what the group found really were there were very, very low levels of prevalent inf um, disease, but very high levels of prevalent infection. And when uh, they followed these children up for two years, they found only two children, or well, found that no children developed disease uh, in this context. And really this questions whether in this particular context um, there is rationale or, or utility in performing, um, giving prevention therapy. Next study um, looked at children in Kenya with HIV who um, often are quite difficult to diagnose with TB in that population. And um, microbiological testing is sometimes challenging, as are clinical uh, and um, symptom-based testing. So this group used the monocyte-lymphocyte ratio and divided their children, where there were 179 children, into confirmed TB, uh, clinically diagnosed TB, and unlikely TB, and used the monocyte-lymphocyte ratio in that group. They found that when comparing the confirmed disease to uh, the other children, they had good sensitivity and specificity with this ratio normalizing on treatment. Final study is a BCG study. This was presented yesterday at the student session. Um, and this really looked at, uh, although we sh all children sh in the world should receive BCG vaccination at birth, this is uh, not always done. In fact, only a third of children receive BCG in the first week, and uh, only 50% get it in the first month. So this group looked at different scenarios, 12 different scenarios of giving BCG at different um, stages um, from birth, from uh, six weeks when the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis are given, and then at six months and 12 months, and really looked at the difference in mortality changes over time with these different strategies. And what they found is that really um, the highest uh, reduction in mortality is observed when BCG is given to all children at birth. Uh, and I'm going to now pass on to the next group. I would like to share with you what we see uh, in the section of uh, immunology and host genetic. Uh, we observed uh, there was two uh, good presentations on that the database developed by FIND, which will be launched next year around uh, January 2018. And there was also a systematic review, which uh, have a data extracted from 3, 000, uh, 375 uh, study and I think this is a likely to be the largest collection data of its kind for now. We observe also more study on tuberculosis, genetic immunology, and serology markers in poster session and short oral uh, session. There was also study presented on helmet infection in associated with increased rate of tuberculosis progression and decrease of TB immunity. This study exploring mechanism of helmet causes by persistent change in the gene expression and function causing disturbance in uh, immunological function. Um, there was also a nice uh, presentation done on tuberculosis lymphadenitis uh, in southwest of Ethiopia. Uh, around resistance to new and old drug uh, with new mutation, there was a nice presentation on beta kilin and clofazimine resistance in MDRTB and XDRTB patients. This study examined mutation conferring resistance to beta kilin and clofazimine, which is highly relevant to DRTB cases. There was also a, a nice presentation on discordance result between phenotypic and genotypic resistance, and we observed that 
probably we are missing some ENH resistance linked to the presence of uh, mutation in kite gen RG 463. There was also a study which showed the impact of LPA, which are not able to really predict low level of e reference, uh, resistance to ENH and PC. On the section of TB laboratory service implementation, there was a nice study on impact of genospat MTB reef on treatment of initiation and outcome of tuberculosis and MDRTB patient in Vladimir TB dispensary from Russia. This study show us the time to re uh, treatment comparison between patient uh, before uh, treatment and a uh, post genospat uh, group. Uh, we uh, also have implementation challenge on around Genospot. This was study around uh, coming from different countries, Botswana, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Malawi, sorry, Namibia, Nigeria, Tanzania, and uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Uganda. This session show us the challenge we have around uh, Genospot implementation, but there are also solutions which are showing us that using continuous quality improvement uh, approach, using GX alert, performance-based remuneration uh, shame for uh, motivating staff, and also supervision can improve and uh, uh, decrease the challenge observed during the implementation. More application on rapid molecular test also was uh, observed during this conference. And one of them is finding more patients by double testing with genus, but, but have an, an impact on the financial cost. Uh, there was uh, also some study around genus, but using rapid diagnostic tools in smear negative patient, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis cases, which have an impact on uh, also on uh, urinary samples. There are also many uh, 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 presentation on uh, Genospot Ultra, new cartridge, which increase sensitivity and reduce specificity. And this uh, presentation show us the introduction of Genospot Ultra, which will be soon in the market, require consideration uh, and consequence on the new test with reduction of specificity. Uh, this have to be applicable on uh, taking in local epidemiologic setting before this decision implementation. We uh, also saw some uh, presentation on solution to other laboratory implementation challenge. This is around transport uh, of specimen using, for example, omniscient sputum, and also how to improve the database at microscopy network using a, a e-lab register, electronic lab registers, and how to link the private sector to the public and the cent uh, TB centers using pharmacists. Good evening, everyone. So, in the present scenario, TB needs political will and resources. This is a symposium held at the Encuentro session room on 13th October under the above title. It is one among the TB elimination strategies by engaging the stakeholders. I have taken only a portion of it which discusses some of the initiatives taken in social mobilization, community ownership, and involvement of partners for universal access to TB care in India by the state government of Maharashtra. Totally, they have raised more than $1. million within one year from August 2016 to August 2017. They adhere to the thrust areas of the National Strategic Plan 2017-25 of India. It was done in the second largest developed state of India, which has 120 million population. They use the collaborative model for resource generation. This is a posters discussion. The objective is to draw political will from Zimbabwe policymakers and parliamentarians for TB. And they did it. How? They sensitized them, 
had dialogues with 30 portfolio committee members and the results are they have signed the Barcelona Declaration and establishment of a national TB caucus resulted in Zimbabwe elected to co-chair the African Regional Caucus. They have pledged to engage the Ministry of Finance to increase allocation for TB. In 2017, 13 MPs took public TB screening during the World TB Day, raised awareness and encouraged TB screening in their constituencies. Now you would, you would have seen some people with white t-shirts freezing in cold from time to time. I don't think so. It is so cold here. Do you feel? Do you feel cold? No. But it is a mob from the global coalition of TB activists to include the TB affected communities for a successful high level meeting to be held soon. And another one. Did you get a chance to dance here in the conference? But I did. Why I did all to help TB Alliance get louder, louder than TB. Thank you. So I'm going to start with IPT. Maybe. And Ryan and her team investigated whether strategies directed at the patient or the provider could increase IPT uptake in primary care clinics. The patient intervention included short interactive presentations, posters, and calendars aimed at encouraging the patients to request IPT at the clinic. Clinician intervention included training, group discussions, action planning, mentoring, and SMS support. While the provider-directed intervention was more successful at increasing IPT uptake, as you can see, this did not result in meaningful gains, and any gains realized were not sustained after the intervention ceased. This study was a well-thought-through intervention, invested considerable effort in the program, and yet it showed no real benefit, and this highlights ongoing challenges in implementing IPT in resource-limited settings. But to report some good news on IPT, Dr. K presented an assessment of IPT implementation among children up to 17 years of age in Swaziland. Among the interesting findings here was that while clinicians seemed reluctant to initiate IPT in patients who were poorly adherent to their antiretroviral treatment, in fact, among patients who had ARB adherence rates, rates of less than 95%, initiating IPT actually improved antiretroviral adherence, although the numbers in this group were small. Ngeno and team performed an audit of pediatric cases over three years in 10 TB clinics around Tanzania. Among the nearly 1,200 pediatric cases identified, the majority of which were under five years of age, 90% had been tested for HIV. But of those tested, 40% were infected. And of this large percentage of HIV positive patients, just under 50% had started antiretroviral treatment. These sobering findings highlight ongoing barriers to HIV testing and treatment of children in these kind of settings. Hong and colleagues performed a systematic review and meta-analysis of existing evidence of the risk of HIV co-infection on acquiring aminoglycoside-induced hearing loss among MDR patients in sub-Saharan Africa. In the eight studies that they assessed, there was an overall 22% increased risk of hearing loss in co-infected patients on aminoglycoside-containing regimens. And while the authors acknowledge it was a small study, and in addition, some of the outcome assessments were subjective, this study does provide evidence for considering aminoglycoside sparing regimens or adjunctive therapies to reduce hearing loss in these patients. And it certainly points to the need for better and more frequent hearing loss screening. Sarah Old and team reminded us that risk factors and predictors of COPD and pulmonary mor morbidity in TBHIV patients are not well described. And in an ongoing cohort study, they seek to characterize pulmonary function at baseline and following ARV and TB treatment initiation in patients newly diagnosed with these diseases. Preliminary findings show that some changes in pulmonary function among these patients 
sorry, show that the changes in pulmonary function among these patients is heterogeneous. 20% of patients had airflow limitation. Nearly 50% of patients had a decline in lung function in the first four weeks, but overall the trends appear to be improving. Sorry, I slipped sides too soon. And while over 30% showed an improvement in their pulmonary symptoms, 20% of patients reported an increase in symptoms at four weeks. While this study is ongoing and there are no clear results available, I think it highlights an important and under-researched area in TBHIV lung health, and we should watch this space. And now for a slight shift in focus. The HIV section is currently discussing the possibility of expanding its scope and in, in keeping with the change in disease burdens and looking at how lessons learned in HIV can cross-pollinate with other comorbidities. So our late breaker session this year included some diabetes work, and this study was presented a successful program in Zimbabwe in which TB patients were screened for diabetes. 7% of all TB patients screened had possible T diabetes comorbidity and were successfully linked to care. Similarly, screening diabetic patients for TB uncovered 1% prevalence of previously undiagnosed TB in this group. And this confirms the feasibility of conducting bi-directional screening for TB and diabetes in primary healthcare settings especially in resource-limited settings. And then lastly, this is another presentation from the late breaker session that showed that among culture-positive TB patients, diabetes was associated with increased mortality. But among the diabetic patients on this study, metformin use alongside standard TB treatment appeared to reverse this increased mortality associated with diabetes during TB treatment, suggesting a potential role as an adjunct adjunctive to TB treatment. Thank you. Buenas tardes. My name is Lynette McElroy-Hawks. I'm a nurse from Canada, and I'm the program secretary and incoming chair for the nursing and allied professional subsection of the union. I think this has been a fabulous conference, and um, with many thanks to the tone set by the opening plenary, personally for me in particular by contributions um, by the civil society representative also from Canada, Chief William Littlechild. The theme of the slides I will share revolves around the concept of community and acknowledging the impacts we have had, are having, and could have, not just toward TB elimination, but to support health for the entire global community. My first slide is to highlight several excellent presentations on strengthening relationships with Indigenous communities. We heard from Canada, Colombia, and Mexico in this regard. We were introduced to this graphic, which describes one indigenous way of knowing that might be helpful in other contexts as well. To see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous ways of knowing, and to see from the other eye with strengths of Western or perhaps other ways of knowing, but to use both eyes together. Further to that concept is to embrace, and, and, uh, to embrace the practice of empowering affected communities in TB elimination specifically, in finding and treating people with TB. Pardon me, go back. During the oral abstracts on training, we heard about projects to identify and prepare slum volunteers to screen and accompany presumptive cases from their community for testing that showed fantastic results over unaccompanied referrals. We saw findings that the support the effectiveness of community workers in treatment success, reducing death rates, and preventing loss to follow-up. There was a symposium on innovations to improve the health workforce, which is another community. We heard about mobile phones being used on and offline as resource repositories to support workers in the field, and about continuing work with PhotoVoice as a method of participatory action research and a very engaging tool to empower youth and others to increase awareness, understanding, and reduce stigma. We heard about Project ECHO, which is short for Extension for Community Health Outcomes, and how it continues to expand and prove its utility in many contexts, including Kenya, oh, pardon me, Kenya, India, US domestically and binationally with Mexico, 
in the country of Georgia and recently in Guatemala. The nursing and health education communities continue to produce excellent research and products and tools to inform and support patients, families, affected communities, and healthcare providers, including an essential care package for drug-resistant TB and a brand new product just being piloted presently to assist nurses to assess and address side effects during drug-resistant treatment. Here's a screenshot of the tool that's currently being pilot tested. And if you're any interest or more interest in, uh, in this product or becoming involved in the pilot testing, I'd urge you to connect with Anne Raftery. Her email address is, is there on the screen for you. I'll finish by welcoming a new member to the TB section community. That's the TB ethics work group and encouraging all interested parties to join us. Thank you. Hi, um, I'll um, briefly um, present the tobacco control um, section um, sessions. So there was a study um, in India that compared National Health Survey between 2005 and 2015, showing that system strengthening approaches like uh, the Cigarette and Other Tobacco Product Act and ban on flavored additives to tobacco products by the government in India led to approximately 15% decline in tobacco use prevalence amongst males in 10 years. Another study um, that is real versus real campaign included social media posts of tobacco victims alongside um, positive portrayal of tobacco use on Facebook and Twitter. Um, this campaign using the tobacco victim images uh, received 53,000 reactions on social media. And it shows that such strategies could encourage celebrities and filmmakers to work together to protect the health and well-being of those that they influence through um, their films and TV programs. Tobacco excise duty is aimed to control tobacco use in the public, and the funds generated should be used towards promoting tobacco control activities. We all know that, but in Indonesia, the expenditure on universal health care is more than the revenue generated by tobacco tax. And this could be abridged by additional cigarette, uh, cigarette taxes dedicated for the universal health care. The other um, oral abstract is about uh, tracking investments by financial institutions in tobacco companies. Socially responsible investment provides a view on ethical investing uh, to governments and institutional investors and precludes not investing in tobacco industry or its stocks. Now, the definitions of socially responsible investment for screening tobacco investments is perceived variably by financial institutions. And in the absence of an oversight institution or body, investors continue to invest in tobacco companies. Such invest investments made by large lending banks and financial institutions in tobacco industry need to be tracked and we need to ensure that banks have, uh, which have committed to SRI codes conform to these. Finally, there's this, um, there's this study on uh, tobacco cessation counseling uh, in TB patients. We know that most of the world's uh, tobacco consumption is in the low and middle income countries. And we also know that most of the tuberculosis cases are seen in low and middle income countries. And as these two uh, epidemics converge, we see more and more TB patients who smoke and whose smoking leads to worsening of their TB treatment outcomes. In this study, it was seen that tobacco cessation counseling using five A's and five R's uh, could achieve higher treatment adherence in TB patients that smoke. Um, and that's all on tobacco control from my side. Uh, thank you. 
I'm very honored to be here today to present to you some highlights from what was a, a very productive uh, and exciting uh, meeting for tuberculosis. Uh, the, f the first uh, uh, study that I'm presenting to you today uh, was, um, took place in Nicaragua by a group of very dedicated uh, uh, individuals at the National TB Program. Uh, and they incorporated social support uh, into their uh, um, treatment program and actually demonstrated that uh, amongst those who received social support, there was a 91% uh, treatment success. In addition to such things as housing, which you see illustrated quite dramatically on this slide, they assisted people who were under treatment to um, access income generating activities. And they were able to demonstrate that one year after completing their treatment, 73% uh, were still engaged in these activities. Uh, mental health is uh, has been getting increasing uh, attention within the tuberculosis world. We have an active, very uh, productive uh, subgroup in the TB section. Uh, this uh, uh, study that was done in Mumbai um, studied 226 uh, drug-resistant TB patients, 40% of whom had HIV. What they found was that one-third of them required psychiatric consultation, with the leading psychiatric diagnoses being depression, followed by anxiety, and less commonly, psychosis. We do have concerns about some of the medications used in TB causing uh, 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 mental health problems, specifically cycloserine, but in this particular study, they did not see a high rate of cycloserine-associated psychosis. I'm highlighting three different uh, uh, oral abstracts on infection control, two of which use the FAST strategy, uh, which is focused on, on bringing people both to diagnosis and to treatment. Um, the first one was done at a tertiary care facility in Nigeria, and they found that they had uh, a significant number of increase in their ca TB cases detected. Georgia uh, perhaps has one of the, the most extensive FAST programs. A, an initial pilot in two general hospitals had um, uh, 188 of 1,565 unsuspected cases who eventually were diagnosed with TB, representing 12%. Uh, they actually found uh, a, not a very high rate of uh, rifampin resistance in this group, which is probably a good thing uh, as they can get on uh, treatment early. Uh, subsequent to the pilots, FAST has been rolled out uh, uh, countrywide in Georgia. In Ethiopia, they were looking at administrative measures um, so that uh, when uh, TB patients came to clinic, the appropriate infection control interventions would be instituted, uh, such as a designated focal point, uh, an infection control plan, screening of the, of the staff, as well as tracking, uh, this, a tracking system for possible cases uh, and open windows. For LTBI, we've heard some uh, about uh, latent uh, TB infection, and the first two uh, studies highlighted here uh, again bring up the issue of the importance of care cascades and seeing the loss uh, to uh, a care um, through the cascade. Uh, in Indonesia, amongst 369 contacts that this group looked at, less than 50% of them were uh, medically evaluated and only 3% initiated uh, treatment for latent infection. Uh, in the United States, in a clinic in Denver, they didn't fare much better than this. Um, they found that of 32,000 uh, persons uh, that they deemed to be eligible for testing, mostly based on their uh, country of origin and the burden of TB in their country of origin, uh, 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 just under a third were actually tested. Uh, some better news from Taiwan. Um, they've actually institu instituted the 3HP program, uh, which is uh, 12 doses of isoniazid and rifapentine weekly. Um, and they've actually um, treated more than 2,500 people with this uh, regimen. 
Um, they did see severe ad adverse events, although in a relatively uh, small proportion, 1%. And the most common um, uh, adverse effect is a flu-like illness. It's, it's pretty predictable, and, and I think what we learned from the Taiwanese um, uh, study is how we could appropriately counsel patients, uh, 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 given that these symptoms usually happen between the third and fourth doses of uh, 3-HP. Uh, we ha were um, provided with uh, increased uh, evidence around uh, high-dose rifampin, which is of significant uh, interest in ongoing trial design. Uh, and this study um, used multiple different uh, doses and actually pushed the dose up to a maximum of 2,100 milligrams, which represents 35 milligrams per kilogram, which is a dose that uh, most people will not have seen used before. Uh, and it was at this very high dose that they were able to demonstrate reduced time to culture conversion. Uh, the rates of hepatotoxicity, as you can see in the bottom right, were rather variable and did not actually peak at the highest dose. Um, for Paula, I have the wirelessly observed therapy uh, study, uh, which is a novel adherence measure. Um, this is actually an FDA cleared device, which is an, an edible ingestion sensor. Uh, along with this, there's an external wearable patch and a paired mobile device. This means that you can monitor adherence uh, from a distance. Uh, and it, this group uh, did a randomized control uh, trial of 75 subjects who got regular DOT or the, the, uh, uh, what is called WATT. Uh, and it was effective at um, confirming 50% more doses than the DOT. Uh, from the perspective of MDR, uh, we uh, saw uh, very promising news in Rwanda uh, post uh, um, introduction of rapid uh, molecular tests and over a period of 10 years from 2005 to 2015, uh, they saw their uh, MDR prevalence go from 3.9% to 1.4%. Uh, a very nice presentation at the late breaker session yesterday uh, from Mexico has demonstrated some variability in, in MDR rates, but relatively low overall. Uh, importantly, we learned that a significant proportion of people coming to treatment uh, for MDR, TB, have pre-existing baseline hearing loss, uh, which underlines the importance of uh, baseline testing and monitoring in people on treatment. Um, a survey in Europe showed that about a uh, uh, two-thirds um, to three-quarters of the participating centers are actually monitoring QT, that's uh, in Europe, and STREAM was not part of the uh, abstract sessions, but I'm giving you a tiny little snapshot here that amongst the uh, uh, STREAM trial, uh, the intervention arm, there was a 10% uh, uh, rate of uh, elevation of QT. Um, just president presented today for, uh, to assist in the pediatric treatment of multidrug resistant TB was a bioequivalent study of uh, dissolved versus whole bedaquilin. Uh, it was a crossover study, um, and here's the uh, uh, pharmacokinetic uh, um, output, which essentially demonstrated bioequivalence. With respect to MDR treatment uh, outcome, uh, the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières uh, was quite active at this meeting. Uh, in the first study, uh, a little cautionary tale um, with some reversion uh, of persons treated with MDR and a possible concern that the duration of bedaquiline was not sufficient uh, in these uh, uh, persons. The combination of bedaquiline and delaminid was also presented at the late breaker session yesterday. Uh, this uh, was um, undertaken in Armenia, India, and South Africa. Uh, the good news is 26 of 28 are still alive at six months. They actually did not see significant QT pro prolongation despite both of these drugs having some potential to do so. Uh, Niger has successfully scaled up their MDR treatment, and they have uh, 213 patients treated so far. 
uh, and significantly reduced the uh, sus suspicion to treatment start uh, from 165 to 12 days. Uh, we also see the mortality rate for MDR falling in Peru. Um, active case finding uh, in the Philippines, uh, uh, the addition of digital X-ray fluorescent microscope and gene expert has uh, increased the rate of uh, uh, um, cases found with 780 being diagnosed uh, with an active intervention. And in Vietnam, they did a, quite a novel uh, 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 intervention with a single sputum screening. Um, and along with this, uh, prevalence fell from 389 to 176. Uh, in prisons, we had a number of different interventions. This is a very important area. Um, I'll just highlight the last slide that uh, was uh, undertaken in South Africa, uh, where we did learn that depending on how you set up the program, the uh, chest x-ray screening program can actually be relatively expensive. In Zimbabwe, a, a national TB prevalence survey uh, was done. Um, and a, 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 a problem in this setting is that, that of the 2% who were smear positive, a relatively low proportion were actually culture uh, positive. And I, I think this highlights uh, a number of operational issues with respect to uh, prevalence surveys that should be uh, 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 taken into account. Ethiopia has uh, looked at early warning systems to support medicine procurement using the QuantiB tool uh, with significant uh, saving of, uh, of investment. Good evening, all. The Zoonotic TB subsection had a very successful uh, roadmap launch, and participants were really excited to be involved in it. In our group, we had six abstracts from the poster session. Key highlights from the study in India has to do with the fact that 20 of the 100 elephants examined by post-mortem had mycobacterium tuberculosis, highlighting the need for collaboration between human and animal health authorities to reduce transmission between animals to humans. Importantly, again, in India, there was a study conducted to evaluate the knowledge of household owning cattle. And in this, only 12% of the household members were knowledgeable about TB transmission from animals to humans, while in the same setting, 44% and 34% were knowledgeable about the transmission of anthrax and rabies. Another important study that um, was presented has to do with genotyping of mycobacteria isolates from Ghana, where a, a survey was carried out. The highlight of this was that in the survey, there was no embovies found among the population screened. In an interesting study carried out in um, Baja, California, Mexico, the use of the whole genome sequence helped to show unequivocally the evidence of transmission of mycobacterium bovis from cattle to humans and between humans. Another important highlight of the post session was the presentation on mycobacterium bovis in Michigan dairy herd that showed evidence of animal to human transmission. And again, this, this last one came from the uh, late breaker session that focused on the molecular epidemiology of mycobacterium bovis among patients with pulmonary tuberculosis in Ethiopia. Here, only 2% of the population screened had embovies, and importantly, which one of them have refampicin resistance. 
We had two symposia sessions. The important highlights here had to do with tongue swabs for uh, collecting, uh, using, confirming uh, TB using um, tongue swabs. And this is very important in pediatric population. And the use of ferret in tuberculosis transmission because ferrets also sneeze like humans. And the whole genome sequence, um, the importance of it was also showed the precision as a precision tool for economic implication in outbreak investigation because it will help to reduce uh, resources and time in confirming outbreaks, investigations, and confirmation in large population of hearts and in different populations of animals. We also talked about, um, we also, another major highlight was in the area of the whole genome sequence platform that can be used globally in a standardized form with validated pipeline and curated sequence data repository that will be available for global use. Another important one has to do with the emerging threat of mycobacterium origins in cattle and primates in India. And of course, the interesting aspect of active case finding for zoonotic TB among pastoralist population in Nigeria. And emphasis was also shown in the area that of opportunities and challenges that can be uh, uh, gained in effective zoonotic TB control in poor resource settings. And finally, we had this, the expert session that showed the use and highlighted the use and benefits of whole genome sequence in the epidemiology of TB in humans and animals. Thank you. So essentially, that's it from A to Z. We thank you for attending this session. We plan to keep having it every year. And if anyone wants to contribute to helping us do this massive task, you are more than welcome. So I would like to give a huge thank you to these brilliant people sitting here <laughs> who missed most of the afternoon as they were preparing their slides. So thank you, guys. And I guess we're going to have the closing ceremony now. Thank you very much, Stacey, uh, for the great work. Uh, the rapporteur session uh, is, uh, as always, inspiring, makes all of us feel like we've been in all the sessions that uh, happened in the last uh, three or four uh, uh, days of this conference. Uh, and uh, it does demonstrate to all of us uh, the depth uh, and the breadth of the science that was presented uh, uh, in this conference in the last one uh, week or so. Um, I think Stacy has already said this. We're going to miss you as uh, the chair of the CCSA, and I would sincerely want to thank you for the passion, the dedication, the commitment to lead uh, the coordinating committee for scientific activities over the last three uh, years or so. You have worked tirelessly together with your team of volunteers to develop each and every year a great scientific program that we all enjoy. Um, I think <clears throat> please. Stacy, please, if you can come up here, please.
So thank you all. It's been a very tough three years. It's hard to have a full-time job and do this on the side, but we made it through, and I'm being left, you are being left with a, in very good hands with the next chair. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, transitions like those happen, uh, but we never leave uh, uh, spaces in this world blank. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the incoming chair of the Coordinating Committee for Scientific Activities, uh, Dr. Karen Middlecoop. If you could wave from where you are. Karen is a clinician researcher at the Desmond Tutu HIV Center in the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine in Cape Town and has been performing HIV and TB research. Over the past uh, 12 years, Karen has focused largely on public health and epidemiology research, including running a number of community-based studies uh, on the HIV epidemic and its impact on community TB disease rates and transmission. We really, really look forward to working with you, Karen, over the coming year. And we do believe that uh, 2018, you will deliver an amazing conference, as amazing, if not better, than this conference. Thank you very much, Karen. We have come to the end of our conference, and for me, uh, it is the conclusion of uh, a year as uh, president of the union. Uh, I remember in Liverpool being announced to be uh, the president of the union at a function like this. Um, and I think it is an exciting time uh, for uh, all of us. I can somehow sense that uh, we are beginning, not beginning, but we are getting our act together uh, to improve uh, TB care and prevention and to start doing something really tangible uh, for lung health uh, across the globe and especially in low and middle income countries. I think we have seen, uh, and based on what has been presented in this rapporteur session, incredible steps are being taken uh, to find innovative solutions to the problem of TB and lung health. We have heard about uh, new drugs, we have heard about new regimen, we have heard about trans transformative use of technology, and we've heard about extensive research into regimens and diagnostics, among many other things, including community care. I think the work that we started many years ago needs to continue as we try and accelerate towards ending uh, the epidemic of TB and eliminating TB as a public health threat. And you as extraordinary people are just uh, going to be able to, to do that. We have um, heard about um, uh, what uh, is coming in, in the horizon the first ever high-level meeting on TB that is being planned for 2018, which is going to put TB firmly on the political agenda, and hopefully that will transform our fight against tuberculosis. I think we heard about the sense of urgency with which we must uh, do the things that we must do to prevent the millions of people across the world that die uh, every day. I am told uh, but those who count uh, uh, people and events in the world, that as we engage in our conference today, about 5,000 people will lose their lives or have lost their lives because of TB. Now, we are, as you all know, in the era of uh, um, um, digitalization, everything we can do uh, digitally. But I think conferences where we meet like this prevent, present very unique opportunities for us, and, uh, and I think they are the reason that many of us travel far and wide to get to places like this. It's an opportunity for us uh, to network a lot more deeply than we can do digitally. It's uh, uh, a time for us to renew uh, friendships and establish new um, uh, partnerships for research 
uh, going forward. So this is really uh, a very unique, uh, uh, a unique opportunity for us. We listen, we share, we celebrate, uh, we challenge the ideas uh, that other people have developed. So really, really uh, an important event for uh, the membership of the union. It brings together colleagues, union members, TB survivors, uh, partners, and many more uh, to have that ability to meet, uh, uh, to, to discuss the problems of TB and lung health. So we at the union want to commit that we will continue to have these conferences because of the opportunities that they present to us. As we return to our homes, the knowledge that we have gained in this conference, it's my hope and my pledge that that knowledge should be shared with others and should be put into action to help the people that we came here to try and help uh, by gaining more knowledge uh, um, from others. So I want to hope that in fact at the end of the day, um, this conference will provide us with opportunities to go and transform lives um, uh, in our homes and, and hospitals and, and, and research clinics and, and, and what have you. I look forward to um, continuing to lead the union in the second uh, year of my presidency, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, we will have started to build the momentum uh, to find new solutions to the problems of TB uh, and lung disease. At this moment in time, I would like to welcome on stage, if she is around, Carolina Moran from Socios and Salud. Is she here? All right. She... Oh, it was a bit early. Apparently, she is on her way. So, at this moment, I would like to, um, uh, as you all know, this conference, among the things that we also do at this conference is to recognize individuals who have made outstanding contribution to, the pro uh, to TB and lung health. And I just want to mention to you uh, some of the people who uh, received, not, not, uh, who received uh, uh, awards during this conference, and to urge you um, as union members and uh, as others to start thinking about nominating people for these awards for the coming year. This year we awarded the Young Investigator Award uh, Prize went to Dr. Alberto Garcia Basterio for his efforts and success uh, um, uh, in uh, um, controlling TB in Mozambique. The Union Scientific Prize went to Dr. Sarita Shah for her outstanding collaborative and broad-reaching work on drug-resistant TB in Africa. The Karen Stiblo Public Health Prize went to Dr. Rohit Sarin for his work on, uh, uh, on, on, um, uh, on um, TB control and MDR-TB um, uh, nationally and internationally, especially uh, in India. The Princess Chichibu Global Memorial TB Award was presented to Dr. Man Van Dun, who many of you know. Uh, uh, and the first Stephen Lawn Prize was awarded to Dr. Leonard Martinez for his research and leadership uh, that embodies the knowledge, commitment, and spirit that was uh, portrayed by Dr. Stephen Lawn. We had one honorary member that uh, was uh, um, uh, award that was given to Dr. Joseph Amolo Alwoj from Kenya for um, um, uh, for his commitment uh, to TB uh, for many many years and his commitment to the union over the many years that he's been a member of the union. I now want to um, thank um, uh, very sincerely uh, the city of Guadalajara for the opportunity to host, uh, uh, to allow us to host uh, this conference uh, in, uh, in this beautiful city. Uh, we uh, want to acknowledge the huge warmth 
that we received from the people of Mexico uh, who worked very hard to make this conference uh, uh, possible. At this point, <clears throat> Thank you. At this point in time, I think it's appropriate for uh, me to tell you uh, where the next conference, the 49th World Conference on Lung Health, will be held. And I have the pleasure to tell you that uh, uh, the next conference will be held uh, in The Hague in the Netherlands. The theme for that conference um, will be declaring our rights, social and political solutions, and will highlight um, the efforts we are making to eliminate tuberculosis and achieve health-related sustainable goals um, through a rights-based approach uh, and a patient-centered uh, models of care. I think that's the key thing. This conference will be, held, will be um, hosted uh, by KNCV Tuberculosis Foundation that many of us know very well and the seat of uh, The Hague. It is, I'm told, the, peace, the city of peace and justice. It provides a unique environment to link science, human rights, and policy in the design of public health responses and I'm delighted to be able to introduce a filmed message from Edith Shippers. I'm sorry, I'm from Africa. I don't know how to pronounce some of these names, so please forgive me if I got it wrong, who is the Minister of Health and Welfare and Support of the Netherlands. Um, if we can run... The Dutch edition will focus on tuberculosis and related topics. Topics like HIV and AIDS, because many people infected with HIV die of tuberculosis. Topics like the One Health approach to antimicrobial resistance, because TB is its most significant driver. Our National Tuberculosis Foundation is considered a pioneer in tuberculosis control and we have more to share. For example, our experience in vaccine development and new treatments. The innovations our universities are working on and our approach itself, which involves not only healthcare, but also justice, migration, finance, and social affairs. We hope you will share your expertise with us as well. We'll do our utmost to make you feel welcome. So. See you in the Netherlands next year. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, to you and to request uh, 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 Margaret Lemus, the ambassador of uh, the Netherlands in Mexico, to say a few words. Good afternoon, all of you. Buenas tardes, uh, Mr. President of the Union, Dr. Chakaya. Thank you for introducing my country in such a wonderful way. You're almost the ambassador of the Netherlands. Uh, and um, uh, he uh, told you almost everything you have to know. But I have a few words to add for you as delegates. And first of all, um, being a lung patient myself, you hear my, my breath. I, uh, I'm really happy to be at this lung health uh, conference and really indebted to you all. And I'm glad so many of you stayed around for the end of this conference. I gather it's been a long two days uh, with dancing even, I understood, so I'm happy that you're all here. I am here to announce to you that my country, 
The Netherlands will host this conference in 2018 in The Hague. And The Hague, ladies and gentlemen, is known to be the city of peace and justice. And I think it's an excellent choice for your conference, as it is the unique environment to link science, human rights, policy and the design of human rights responses. Um, we have great universities around The Hague, Rotterdam, Leiden University, and uh, uh, Amsterdam. Um, and I think uh, they will all come to the conference. I spoke yesterday at length with the Dutch TB organization, the KNCV, and what I liked about them is their mission. It's very clear and simple. It's the patient. It's all about the patient. The director of the KNCV, Kitty van Wezenbeek, um, I think you all know her. It is her 27th conference. Ladies and gentlemen, delegates, the theme of the conference will be declaring our rights, social and political solutions. Oh, it's up there now. This is very close to our Dutch hearts and very fitting in The Hague, city of peace and justice. Human rights approaches and political commitment are crucial in the fight against TB, air pollution and tobacco. For my country, access to healthcare, human rights and equity are fundamental values. Like the minister just mentioned, AMR, AMR is an important to, topic too. Here in Mexico, my, our embassy is working with the Mexican government to get regulation on wastewater for the pharmaceutical industry and to eliminate antibiotics from animal feed. Worldwide, we are actively working in the G20 and the, uh, in the UN on this important issue, and we've just raised our contribution to the World Health Organization uh, for the uh, fight against AMR. The year 2018 will be a crucial year for uh, TB control globally. We, or you, need to take forward the political momentum of the WHO Moscow Ministerial Conference in November 2017 to the UN high-level meeting on TB in 2018, as just mentioned by you, Dr. Chakaya. We need to follow up on the AIDS conference. Um, we need to follow up on the AIDS conference in July 2018 in Amsterdam to build bridges between the fight against TB and HIV. Having both conferences in the Netherlands in 2018 will give us the opportunity to reinforce collaboration between the TB and HIV communities. We are looking forward to seeing you all in Holland in 2018. The Hague is a wonderful city, and you should all reserve some time to visit our beautiful museum, to go and see the Nederlands Dans Theater, or to get some fresh air at the beach. Or do all three. Each and every one of you is most welcome, and I want to emphasize that. Um, and you would expect that from my country. So all of you are welcome, no matter race, religion, sexual orientation. Um, for those of you who need a visa, please make an appointment as soon as possible at our embassies, as some of our embassies have a waiting list for visa appointments. So the sooner your application, the better. I would also like to thank uh, the Mexican organization for uh, hosting this wonderful conference in Guadalajara. I would like to thank you all for your dedication to TB and lung patients. And we are very happy to welcome you in The Hague in 2018. As we say in Dutch, tot ziens in Den Haag. And I would now like to introduce the, president, the director of the KNCV, Kitty van Wezenbeek. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Shakaya, dear colleagues, dear friends, I was asked to provide the translators with my presentation, but after hearing our ambassador, I think there's a lot of repetition. So I will improvise a bit. Um, 
Our Minister of Health and our Ambassador have already expressed their commitment to make next year's conference a great success. I just want to add some personal notes and stress that KNCB, Tuberculosis Foundation, and the city of The Hague will do all we can to make you feel welcome. It's a cozy international city. Everybody speaks English, easy to reach, and it's good to relax after what I hope we'll have an optimal mix of great science, activism, and networking. Again, as the city of peace and justice, The Hague is the perfect environment to declare our rights. It's now or never. With the ministerial conference coming and a UN for the first time ever discussing TV, if we don't use this, it's, it's well, we have lost the opportunity. Um, as I hope, I hope, I really hope that the Union Conference in The Hague will mark the beginning of translating all those political promises by the ministers, by the UN, heads of states, into action. Um, it will be uh, the, the third time, you may not be aware, but it will be the third time in the history, the 114 year history of KNCV, that we host the Union Conference. The first time was in 1932. The second time was in 1967. Um, so we really felt it was time to bring back this conference to the Netherlands and to the city where KNCV was established in 1903, yeah, we are older than the Union, as the umbrella organization of many civil society town-based organizations. I am proud of our civil society roots and decades of supporting, protecting, treating, curing TB patients regardless of their social, economic, legal status or nationality. In fact, the Netherlands was the first country where people are, who do not have a legal status, where we were able to convince the government that they can stay in our country until they have um, uh, dealt with their free treatment. We look forward to sharing our Dutch innovations with you, also illustrating that ending TB is not a dream. It's a reality when all stakeholders, both public and private, work hand in hand. On a very personal note, uh, what, as was mentioned, the next year's conference uh, will be my 28th Union Conference. So, that means two things. <laughs> That means two things, that I'm getting old, but the other thing is that apparently it was important to me. And many people in TB work in isolation. And um, I, when I started as a young doctor, uh, I started absorbing the science. Later I was the chair of the TB section, then I was a keynote speaker, and nowadays I'm just running around in circles between partners' meetings. The union conferences are unique in bring, bringing together those flocks of different types of TB people who share a mission. I trust that next year's edition in The Hague will bring all that science and activism um, and more. And we'll do anything we can do to, to, for, for that. KNCV staff members are pathfinders in TB control, but in 2018, they will make you pathfinders in the city of The Hague, as was said. Many restaurants, the sea, museum, um, will make it nice in addition to, um, to what brings us together in the Union Conference. We are excited. The TB flags, we, 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 when the Union came to inspect us, the Hague, we had the Union flags around the lake, uh, around the Houses of Parliament. When you come to The Hague, The Hague will breathe TV 
and the union flags will be there again around the Houses of Parliament. Thank you. Join us. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador and Kitty, for, uh, for those remarks and for making us salivate to get to uh, The Hague. We wish we were doing that tomorrow. Um, it's time to close this uh, conference, but I think it would be just an major injustice if we do not thank the people who have made this uh, conference uh, the great success that it has been. I think I would first of all want to thank uh, Stacy again and the Coordinating Committee for Scientific Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you should give them a big clap. <laughs> These are individuals that have other things that they need to do, but they dedicate their time and their energies to make sure that your conference has a scientific content that makes you come back every year. And for that, we want to say a big thank you to you. I would also like to thank the union staff that worked tirelessly to make this conference uh, possible. There is a unit within uh, the union called the Conference Unit, led by Emily Bliss and her colleagues. And I want uh, to request you, ladies and gentlemen, to also give them a big clap for working so hard. In the last few days that you've been here, you may have seen, I think you are not may, you have seen young people wearing red t-shirts, directing you to places, showing you around. These are volunteers that have made it possible for us to enjoy the conference that we have enjoyed so much. Please. Thank you, thank you so much. And that brings us to a real beautiful thing, but even the best of cakes as you eat it has to come to an end. So our cake has come to an end this year, but we're looking forward to the big cake again in 2018. And that brings us to the end of uh, the 48th uh, Union World Conference on Lung Health. I want to thank you most sincerely for attending this conference. And I want to wish you all safe journeys as you travel back to your homes. Thank you very much.